good morning. Nice weather we're having, isn't it? It is definitely a blessing to see folks here. I know that the Lord is extremely pleased to have you here. And I know, I know it's one of those things that, well, there's a safety issue and, and there's just something about you people. Just something about you people. It's one of those things where you look outside and it's snowy and if there was ever a morning for you to stay in bed, it's this morning. However, I can't miss seeing your face, man. And being able to enjoy one another and hang out with fellowship. And we got plenty of coffee. Uh, we went there today to the donut place, and they already have our 23 dozen made. And I go to her, and I say, well, we're only going to probably need 13 dozen. And she went, oh, okay. And so she starts bringing up 13. And I said, did you make all 23 already? And she said, yes, sir. And I said, then come on with it. Give us 23. Yes. And the, we'll pray that the people that show up, there will be no calories in these donuts. <laughs> so we're driving down the street, and we're getting over here to the church. Of course, we're going slow, and we're sliding around. And the thing that amazes me is that on uh, Quaker in the Loop, there are the two guys selling newspapers. And I'm like, oh, I cannot believe, man. They're out here doing their thing. And so I, I bought a newspaper, and all of a sudden, my dad gets out of my car. Right there. And I said, what are you doing? And he opens up the back and he gives this guy a dozen donuts. There you go, buddy. Yeah. So he gets these dozen donuts. He starts hollering at the other guys, come eat, come eat. And, uh, it brings me to today's sermon because it has been said, if you want to see God's sense of humor, tell him your plans. Sometimes things don't work out the way you want them to. <laughs> yeah, what do you mean sometimes? That's, that's kind of all the time. Who would, was able to prepare for this weather change? The world changes and it throws curveballs. And we are a people that like to have plans set out. Now, some of us like to say we're free-spirited. But the truth is, we just don't like responsibility, amen? amen? I may go to work, I may not. I'm just free-spirited. No, what you're saying is, it depends on how I feel. But it's one of those things, when you sit there and you say, this is what needs to take place. These are my goals in life. And then all of a sudden, your plans change. Or God changes your plans. We get extremely frustrated, don't we? I mean, even the smallest amount of change can make us look at God and go, why? And we get frustrated. And you have to understand that the enemy always likes to change plans. But here's something that we must understand. In Job 42, we learn something about God. Job 42 says this. This is right after Job had been questioned by God and absolutely was told, Job, who are you? You are not God. How can you think the way I think? And this is Job's response, Job 42, 1 through 6. Then Job replied to the Lord, I know that you can do all things. No purpose of yours can be thwarted. No purpose of God's can be changed. You ask, who is this that obscures my plans without knowledge? Surely I spoke of things I did not understand, things too wonderful for me to know. You said, listen now, and I will speak. I will question you, and you will answer me. Job says, my ears had heard about you, but now my eyes have seen you. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. This is pretty serious because a lot of times when we present God with our plans, it does not mean that they are God's plans for us. 
In fact, it, it's almost, if you think about it, insulting, if you will. I know that you're God. I know that you see all things. I know that you love me and you know what's best for me. However, these are my plans. Hook me up. This is what I'm looking for. Anything less than this, I'm not going to settle for. And a lot of times, here's the truth and the sad part of it. Many people leave the faith of God. Leave Christianity because their plans did not come to fruition. Understand this. It's not about God trying to get you into bad situations. We do a good enough job ourselves. It's about God going, be still and trust me. I know what you need better than you do. And it is so funny how many times in my life, even this week, in my morning, I would say, Lord, I trust you. Do all you have in mind. And by that afternoon, I am a whiny, complaining baby because my plans that day did not work out. We do this. And we wonder why we continue to have issues when the enemy tells us, see, God's not real. If God was real, he would do what you want. There's nothing in Scripture that says God will do what you want. There's many times it says present your prayer request to the Lord. And the peace that surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. He didn't say nothing about an answer, did it? Here's the key that we must learn today. God is not for your plans. His plans cannot be changed. So here's what we say. Well, Pastor Travis, if that's true, then I think God's a pretty bad God. Because we have disease that are uncurable here. So you tell me that's God's plan, and there's good people that die, and that's God's plan. No, 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 no. Don't blame God. The reason why we have so many problems in this world is because God's plan was that we would have free will and free choice. And boy, we've done a bang-up job, haven't we? Why is there greed and suffering in this world? Because of us. Maybe it's because that's a direct consequence for the world saying, let us become what we want, instead of the world saying, you know what, God? You tell us what you want. Because I can promise you right now, if our entire nation would come together and not say, here's our plan for the future, but bow down before God and say, you tell us Americans what we need to do. I promise you, you have not experienced how good life can be when God is in control. But here's the deal. He's going to change the plans of Americans. Because he'd say, all this wealth that you have in America, you're going to give it away. Whoa, hold on a second, God. We know that's not from you because your desire is to bless us. And God says, I'm trying to bless you. Get rid of your junk. Oh, no, no, I worked hard for it. <laughs> really, you worked hard for things that are absolutely keeping you from God. Some of us in this room, the best time in your life was when you were left with nothing. Yeah, amen. You had nothing except God, and you're like, oh, life is horrible. And all of a sudden, you experienced a peace that surpasses understanding. You had nothing except you had everything within. You maybe were not socially uh, appealing. However, spiritually, you were walking with God. Then what happens, we get back to the point we start getting our stuff back, right? We get what we call our life back. And then once we start feeling pretty comfortable, we all of a sudden forget about that necessity of God. We find ourselves in trouble again. Amen? Here's a harsh truth. Harsh, harsh truth. His plans are higher than my plans. They are. But if you're like me, you like to plan things out. As many of you know, I'm about to become 40 years young. Yeah, next week. Yeah. And I think it's pretty hypocritical that a man who's older than me comes up here and says, y'all should come next week and see old age. That's all I'm saying. I mean, I'm not pointing fingers or anything, but look at my hands. Look at my hands. 
I'm getting older and I look at 40 and I'm going, oh man. I look back at the first 40 years and especially the last 20. And I have to honestly sit there and say, thank you God for not answering my prayers. You guys know most of my story and what I wanted to be and what I wanted to do. And man, what a mess. And I sit there and I say, praise the Lord that you have done what you desire because I love it. But then I look at the next 40 years. What goals and plans should I put together for my next 40 years? Oh, by the time I'm 50, here's what I want to see happen. And honestly, I think God's going, wow, wow, yeah. Because honestly, there's nothing I can do on my own that will be better than God's plan for me. Sometimes that's hard. Notice this. Every Christian will get to this crossroad. And here's the sad part. Let's just be extremely honest. You guys drove in slippery sleighs in winter wonderland, and you're here. Let's just get to a truth, amen? amen? This truth is that every Christian comes to the crossroads when you will have to decide, is it my plans or is it God's plans? And you can't fool anybody. It's between you and God. And God sits there, and in Jeremiah 29, he says, I know the plans I have for you, plans not to harm you but to prosper you. To give you life. And when I say that word right there, prosper and life, what do you think of? Oh, we start thinking of blessings. And I'm not saying that they're not blessings. We start thinking of things. And in our minds, we start going, oh, that's what he will restore. Are you sure? The truth is, he knows what it will take to give you life to the fullest. And it might be getting rid of some of who you are. It's so funny, in our culture, we think to have more is to gain more. I'll never forget in the news, Michael Jackson had went on a shopping spree and he spent $600,000 in one afternoon. He went nuts. Whatever he wanted, he bought. The next headline, the next day, was that he returns everything he bought. It's because he got home and he had all this stuff and he's like nothing he went out to buy whatever it is he's missing he gets home and he looks at all these things look at all my riches yet I still feel the way I do many of us in this room when we start talking about getting our life back together or continuing to walk with God I think the enemy likes to plant into our brains grandeur thoughts of what God should do for us and don't we share that with each other? Don't we go to each other and say, hey, James, I, didn't, I just want to tell you something. I was praying to God this morning, and he said he's going to use me in huge ways. Aren't you glad you know me? <laughs> Next thing you know, I get a call from the missionaries that says, we need somebody to come scrub toilets in Africa. And I go, that's not God, because he said he's going to use me in huge ways. And God says, you will find peace and joy, and you will find my ministry through you while you scrub toilets in Africa. Now we got a problem. Here comes the crossroads. Am I going to trust God that he knows what's best for me, Or am I going to say, I know what I need? In my life, there's been many times I said, I know this is the Lord, and I'm excited about it, only to pursue it and find out it wasn't the Lord. This is just me personally. This is not for everybody else. But usually when the Lord is telling me something, I'm usually not okay with it. It usually does not appeal to my flesh. When the Lord says, forgive that person, ooh, I don't feel like doing that. I pretty much know that's probably the Lord. And if my flesh tells me the Lord wants you to beat that person up, I'm like, yes, praise Jesus. And God's like, yeah, that ain't me. Yeah, that's the burrito you ate, dude. That ain't me. It never 
amazes me through my life how many times I'd watch a movie and go, ooh, the Lord has spoken to me. I'm going to be just like that. Do you understand the Lord doesn't want you to be like anybody else except him? In fact, when we all understand to be more like him, we become individual. See, God never said, I'm going to make Christians exactly the same. He never made one of us exactly the same. Amen? And so in that, there's truths that we have to understand that his plans are better than ours. John chapter 6, verses 47 through 71 shows us a moment when it got extremely real. Because you know here, we like to keep it real. Since we're talking about keeping it real, how many of you bikers rode your motorcycle today? <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay, that's mean. I'm sorry. <laughs> but how many of you in your Ford Prius drove to church this morning? Amen. And without leathers. All right, forget it. Nobody has a Prius. Fiesta. Fiesta. John chapter 6, 47 through 71 says this. This is right after Jesus has been talking to the Jews, and they get into a debate on who he is. And he says, very truly, I tell you, listen to these words in the scripture, the one who believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Verse 49, he says, your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, yet they died. But here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which anyone, anyone may eat and not die. But here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which anyone may eat and not die. That was 50. 51, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Then the Jews began to argue sharply amongst themselves. How can this man give us flesh to eat? Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. For my flesh is real food, and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in them. Just as the living Father sent me and feeds on me, I'm sorry, the Father sent me and I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Your ancestors ate manna and died, but whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. He said this while teaching in the synagogues in Capernaum. On hearing it, many of his disciples said, This is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? Aware that his disciples were grumbling about this, Jesus said to them, Does this offend you? My plans are better than your plans, says God. Does this offend you? Verse 62, then what if you see the Son of Man ascend to where he was before? The Spirit gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. The words I have spoken to you, they are full of the Spirit and life, yet there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus had known from the beginning which of them did not believe and who would betray him. He went on to say, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless the Father has enabled them. From this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. You do not want to leave too, do you? Jesus asked the twelve. Simon Peter answered, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. Then Jesus replied, Have I not chosen you the twelve, yet one of you is a devil? He meant Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, who thought though one of the twelve was later to betray, betray him. Excuse me. In this story, we can look at a couple of points. First of all, they were offended because this was contrary to their plans. We like to follow people. We like to follow fads in this country. In fact, we will jump on a bandwagon of a team who's winning... And then if the underdog wins, 
we will change our jersey shirt to the one who just won and say, I've been a lifelong fan. Because we like to associate with who is popular and current. We do. Going back to Michael Jackson, there was a time everybody wore jackets with zippers in them. Did anybody have one? I had mine. I even wore a white glove. <laughs> Kid you not. And at Texas Tech football games, I was break dancing. What? <laughs> and I had hair. Thank you. <laughs> like I said, the plans change, right? Keeping it real. <laughs> Keeping it real. <laughs> but things change, but we like to jump on that. Listen to this. This is a tragedy. Who's going to trust Jesus when the world disproves his existence? Think about it. If you don't think they're going to disprove the life of Christ, you got another thing coming. They're going to prove it by facts. They're going to have it on TV. They're going to show that it's just a joke. And there's going to be many people that sit there and say this Jesus thing was a good idea, but it's not very real. They're already doing it. And if that's where your faith is and based on if Jesus is popular or not, then don't ever say you knew him. We got to get to a point to where we say, I don't need facts. To where the world will look at us and say, then you were foolish. What they call foolishness, I call faith. I don't have to be proved. I know it's proved because I see him in you. I hope you see him in me. Not by just standing up here and talking, but how well we love one another. So that way, when it becomes extremely unpopular in this culture, and actually Christians are looked like as fools or holy rollers, which many of us have already been called that, those of you who've been in the church for a long time. In fact, some of you in this room were the ones that called us that. <laughs> and how quickly you become what you once despised, amen? I can't stand Christians, man. They're always smiling and stuff. And here you are today. Well, I'm so glad to be at church. I don't care how snowy it is outside. I just love people. And that used to not be you. Can I get an amen? amen. That's right. <laughs> Jesus tells them this. The spirit gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. So let's look at this. When you make plans, do you make plans off of your spirit or your flesh? You make them off your flesh. Because that's how we operate. That Our brains, they're geared to make decisions based off our experience, how we feel. Many of us in this room like to drink sodas, but some of us in this room, we drink different sodas. And it's all on what pleases your flesh. What some find is delicious, another may find is not very good. Yet you, because of your flesh, will choose when you go out to eat which drink you want. That's why there's not one drink for everybody. In fact, how many of you call sodas Coke? You go up. Yeah, nobody says soda pop here, man. <laughs> People come up and they go, you want a Coke? Sure. What kind? <laughs> we do that, right? And wouldn't it be funny if all of a sudden you went to the restaurant and you didn't even get asked what you wanted to drink. They just gave you something. Pop, 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 pop. And you're like, wait a second. I didn't order this. Because our flesh tells us what we're going to do. That's why we have options. But if you want to have true life, just like the scripture says, the spirit gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. And we can test this right now. If you're to gain everything in the world that pleases your flesh and you die, does your flesh go with you? No. In fact, we got to bury that flesh. Do you know why we have to bury that flesh? Because it begins to deteriorate, fall apart, stink. That's funny. Yeah, it stink. Oh, I'm sorry. You're so wise. Spirit, however, goes beyond flesh. Watch this. If you have the love for a family member, 
you will have that love through eternity because it lasts forever. And I can prove it because many of you have love for someone in your family that has passed. Has your love for them died? Never will. It'll last forever. And why do we spend so much time on flesh when flesh just absolutely can hold us down? And it's hard to look at a God that is actually an imaginary friend in the sky. (laughs) Nobody can say, here's proof of God. All we can do is say, I just know that I know that I know that God loves me and he sent his son Jesus to die on the cross for me. And in that I have life. People may say, well, I find that foolish. I find that uh, irresponsible and it's a scapegoat. Fine, whatever you think it is. In fact, if I die tonight and I just all of a sudden am in a long sleep. And I'm like, where's God? And then all of a sudden I come to this realization that he does not exist. I will not look back at my life and go, boy, what a horrible life that I believed in something and had hope, peace, and joy. Boy, I sure wish I was as miserable as everybody else that doesn't believe in God, right? In fact, here we are with uh, Thanksgiving coming around the corner. Do you think their plans changed? If you really focus on history, and I do because I'm becoming older, the History Channel is awesome. When the pilgrims came over, we have all these pictures of them coming out and shaking hands with the Indians, and then they had a big feast, and we call that Thanksgiving. You know, the first settlers that came all over almost froze to death. They barely survived. Their plans didn't work out. There had to be something that sustained them beyond just this land, physical stuff. That's why they absolutely had to hold on to the Word of God. The Word of God in a family, they didn't have Bibles everywhere. They usually had one Bible that was from the family that was handed down. And that was their entertainment. Now follow me here. Our entertainment is to be entertained on the TV. Their entertainment was to read scripture that gave life. And we wonder why we call ourselves blessed, but we're more chained up than ever before. Amen? Number three is this one. This was a very scary point. It says, have I not chosen you the twelve, yet one of you is a devil? It is possible for you to walk with God and never know him. Let that sink in. You're around it. You attend church. You say the right things. But you don't know God because you will not surrender your plans to him. There comes a time where I like to call it the cliff moment. When Jesus gets you to the end of the cliff of sanity. I don't know what you want to call it. And he says, do you trust me? And you say, yes, Jesus, I trust you because I followed you to this cliff. And I trust you. And Jesus says, now jump. And we say, nope, I'll just sit right here with you, right here. And Jesus will be patient with you, okay? And it's just like that. And you know, let the Spirit reveal to you many times, and the Lord continues to say, trust me, now jump. And you say, no, no, I'm just getting comfortable right here. In fact, I'm going to pull up a chair. And you pull up a chair, and you're looking over the cliff, and you're like, man, Jesus, thank you for bringing me to this place. It's beautiful. I can experience your presence Oh, it's just a blessing. And God goes, I'm glad. You ready to jump? No, I'm comfortable here. And before you know it, it's over. And Jesus says, man, I'm sorry you didn't jump. Oh, but I was there with you. I hung out with you. But you did not trust me. You did not give yourself to me. Now follow me here. What it does is it makes us ask a serious question. What is our part when shifting plans take place? This is the tricky part. Here's the crossroads. Many of us in our life, we screw up and say, I guess that was God's will. I got in trouble, I got caught, I guess that was God's will. You got caught because you broke the law and that's why you went to jail. However, God is not afraid of jail, he'll go with you. 
In fact, if you really be honest with yourself, he's probably there the whole time that you were messing up going, don't do this. There's a better way. Don't do this. My plans are better than yours. And you said, shut up. I don't trust you. I know who I am. I'm going to be this way forever. Next thing you know, you're in trouble. And God says, I am still here. And we surrender. We jump off the cliff. And as we walk with God, we start having these experiences of life and life to the fullest. And then we're out of trouble. And it's like God takes us to another cliff. Trust me with your prosperity. Trust me with your questions. Trust me with your answers. Trust me with your children. Trust me with your job. Trust me with your everyday life. But when we get our life back is when we begin to say, okay, God, this is the part I'll let you have. Leave this part alone. How about this? There was a time when I met with a bunch of pastors at a restaurant. And we just met with two pastors. We just started loving on each other. The next thing you know, pastors started hearing about it. And before you know it, we're, we're having to have a room to ourselves one day a week because there's so many pastors showing up. It was awesome. We're just loving on each other. We're, we're helping each other's wounds and bandaging them up. And there was probably about 35 pastors in there. And all of a sudden, one of us said, we should be doing something. We should be doing something. And I sat there and went, yeah. If we're together, we should be doing something. And one of them stands up and says, we need to be doing something and Travis should lead us. And I went, that is God. I will lead you all. And we put this whole thing together about what we're going to do to impact the city. And we're going to do this and we're going to do that. And all of a sudden it just fell apart. And I'll never forget God going, who do you think you are? I brought you guys together just to sit. And my plans are for you to have lunch and chill out. I will do my thing in you. But it was one of us geniuses that stood up and said, we should do something for God. Understand this, ladies and gentlemen, you cannot impress God with your plans. You can't. We shouldn't be telling God, here's the plans I have to do for you. Instead, we should say, do your plans in me. And there is a huge difference. In shifting plans, we must hold true to what Psalms 146 says. If there's anything you hear today, if your trip in the snow is worth it, may it be these words for you today. Psalm 146. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, my soul. I will praise the Lord all my life. I will sing praise to my God as long as I live. Listen to this. Do not put your trust in princes, in human beings who cannot save. When their spirit departs, they return to the ground. On that very day, their plans come to nothing. Blessed are those whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord their God. He is the maker of heaven and earth, the sea and everything in them. He remains faithful forever that is important he remains faithful even when we are not give me an amen. amen verse 7 he upholds the cause of the oppressed and gives food to the hungry the lord sets prisoners free the lord gives sight to the blind the Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the foreigner and sustains the fatherless and the widow. But he frustrates the ways of the wicked. The Lord reigns forever. Your God, O Zion, for all generations, praise the Lord. That is a powerful scripture. Notice this next slide. Fatherless, widow, bowed, blind, foreigner, prisoners, hungry, oppressed. Many of us in this room can say, I identify with one of those titles. 
What do all these have in common? Next slide. They embrace the need for a Savior. They embrace it. In our culture, we don't want to need for anything, right? Because our culture has said, if you need something, that means you're not getting it done. The truth is we should embrace the need of a Savior. Embrace the need of something that speaks to our spirit, which gives life. But instead, we go to those things that please our flesh. They embrace the need of a Savior. Even if you do not need certain things that others do. Maybe some of us in this room have never been a prisoner. Some of us in this room, we've never been a widow. We've never been fatherless. Some of us have never been a foreigner. Never been bowed down. We've never been blind. If you're like me, you've never known what it means to be hungry. Is a habit, but I am in need of a Savior, and I embrace the need of a God who gives life through spirit. Understand this, no matter our place in life, we must embrace the need for a Savior. I give you this, if plans fail, yet you are blameless before God, then let God do his thing. Do not let the enemy throw you off whenever he changes direction on you. Let's say you're working and everything is going good. You're doing everything you need to do. And all of a sudden they bring you in and say, we had to have cutbacks. We got to let you go. If you're blameless before God, that means if you know you've done everything you can and you're good with God, then walk away jobless going, praise the Lord because he has something else for me. Right? However... Do not walk into your uh, uh, boss's office, tell him off, because you're tired of working, walk out and go, praise the Lord, he's going to bless me with another job. (laughs) God's like, I had you a good job. You got offended. See, here's what happens. If the Lord promised that I'm going to reach many people, use me in a mighty way, Sends me to Africa to scrub toilets. What about the person that ministers to the Africans to where millions come to know Christ and the only way they got into that country was as maintenance people to scrub toilets? You do not know God's plans. And as much as we would like to, God is not the revealer of the end result. You understand that? Lord, I will follow you, but before we go, where are we going to end up? And God says, just don't worry about tomorrow, just follow me today. And pretty soon we start going, I do not know where we're going, I don't know what's happening, and we stop. And Jesus stops with us, and he says, you okay, you need to take a breather? (laughs) Yeah, I'm kind of freaking out right now. And God says, all right, keep going. And pretty soon you find yourself in a place That you never thought possible. And you're so alive. I'm going to be extremely vulnerable. And then I'm going to end. That happened to me. With this place. You got to understand. When this place refuge first started. What my plans for it. Is not what it is today. I was to be the pastor. Of all the well to do people. In this city. Thousands of them, and they were going to love me, and I was going to be rich, and everybody's going to like me. Everybody's going to know who I was for Jesus, right? For Jesus. Then in year three, because my plans kept failing, I looked at God and said, I quit. I'm done trying. And it's as if God went, thank you so much. I am tired of fighting you. And I told them, mark my words, I'll never forget them. Because the refuge was struggling. We were downtown. Many of you were there. I had to make the comment that uh, we're probably not going to be able to meet next month at that place because we weren't able to afford it. We're going to probably have to meet at a park somewhere. And the 70 people that were there were like, we'll do whatever we need to do. And I went home, and I was crying, and I prayed to God, and I said, I'm done. I got my hands off of it. But know this, when it drowns, it's your fault. 
I told that to God. I did. I said, because I'm mad. I'd poured my heart and soul into this deal based on my plans. And nothing was taking place. I was so mad at him, I said, I quit. And when it fails, it's your fault, not mine. And at least they'll be able to say about me in heaven that I trusted you all the way to my death. And God was like, ooh. Ooh. Travis, you're scary. God just went, all right. And my dad's back there, and he's the one that takes all the money. I don't ever see it. Have we ever been laid on a bill? Do we owe anybody? And it's not because there's somebody in here that's just on money. It's because the Lord provides. And what was so amazing is that that's when everything started changing. I started getting some people in recovery that were coming to the church. And I was like, whoa, Lord, are you sure? (laughs) Rusty, you remember, you were there. Lord, are you sure this is what we're going to do, right? Okay, look, all the recovery people are like, yeah. (laughs) I said, Lord, are you sure? And he said, go to the meeting. And I'm like, yes, Lord, that's it. You're going to send me to the meeting, and I'm going to help thousands of people through recovery. And God's like, shut your mouth. Oh, my gosh, you're such a magic magnifying mind. And many of you in recovery are like, I know what that is. Okay. (laughs) And I'll never forget, I pull up to uh, the fellowship, and this is when you guys are on off of 50th Street. And I went in and I prayed right before I went in, Lord, show me what I am to do today. And he said, shut your mouth and learn. And I sat down and what I found was not a bunch of people that just had an addiction, but people that just loved on each other no matter what. They didn't care, different, no race, creed, nothing. They all had one common goal, to stay sober. All of a sudden, I got used to the recovery people. I said, yes, Lord, we'll become a recovery church. And then he started sending me churchmen. If you don't know what churchmen are, churchmen are people that have gone to church for a long time. I don't mean to call anybody out or anything like that, but there's some in this room right now that used to sit there and say, I support you. I just can't come. I have a hard time doing that. It's different. And I said, I understand. I know it's still freaking me out. All of a sudden, she's here today. (laughs) And the point is, is now we have churchmen, we have recovery, and we have, oh, man, the bikers started showing up. You crazy bikers, man. And then all of a sudden, here come the preps. Here come the military. Brett's not here, but Bill is. Hoorah. All right. Oh, and then here's what really got me. Ready? And then here come the people that are older. And you're in this room right now, and because you love well, Man, there's not one person that is elderly that does not know they're loved here. Amen. Now you got to understand, I realized, whoa, I had no idea what you were doing, God. And the Lord said, that's right. My plans are higher than your plans. And so right now, here's my prayer. My prayer is not, Lord, fix these plans. Me and Alan come together and our prayer is simply this, Lord, help us not to mess this up. So ladies and gentlemen, when you're looking at Thanksgiving this week, let us thank him for this, that his plans can never be changed and let our plans go. Amen? Amen. Let's stand together. Grab the hand of the person next to you. It's awesome. We can still do that in here. Pray with me. Father, I thank you so much as we reflect this week on what we can be thankful for. Lord, I just say personally, thank you so much for doing all that you have in mind and letting everything that I have in mind fall away. For Father, my plans are of flesh, but yours are of spirit. And your scripture says that spirit gives life and flesh accounts for nothing. 
So, Father, I pray right now that your spirit would fill each and every person that is in here. Fill the people, Father, that are not here with us. Lord, that you would accomplish all you have in mind in your people and through your people. Lord, I thank you so much for everyone who is here because they are here because they are wanting to be here. Do all you have in mind with this, Lord. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Everyone said, amen. Amen. Go and trust well.